Welcome back to the exciting adventures of Beefsteak the Barbarian. Last time, we browsed around um, Harfsong, the Harfsong district of Twin Elms. Talked to a bunch of people, looked through a bunch of shops. I spent probably half the episode just browsing the shops. Didn't actually wind up buying anything yet, but there are some pretty cool items. Alright. Now it's time uh, to go and talk to an elder here. See if we could get uh, permission to visit the other districts. Right, so I want to go in here. Also got another kitty cat named Pumpkin. Lorelei Rose Thorn. You see a ragged child. Oil lamp in hand, making her way down an alleyway. Mud and crust, mud and crusted socks on small, numb feet push forward despite the cold. She has eyes only for the barn ahead and the soft hay inside. She fumbles with the lock, hairpin in hand. Despite the cold, she unlocks the door of expert fingers and slips her gaunt frame inside. Somewhere between closing the door and falling to the floor, the lamp slips from her grasp. The flames tr try the hay tentatively and find it to their liking, reaching faster, further. The girl screams. Outside, a woman whips through the streets, chasing sh shouts and smoke. Her hands are moving before she sees the flames, and from her fingertips erupt three near-invisible missiles of force. They shatter the barn door, but the fire delights in company and roars larger in response. The screaming has stopped. Skinning herself in iron, the woman mutters a prayer and pushes forward into the inferno. The fire screeches, starving, and she responds with fury and frost and hail. She will not be swayed, and the fire is defeated. The child is weak, chest dry and searing with smoke, but alive. The woman carries her out to the cheers and applause as molten sweat dribbled down her silver face. Can I go inside? Sure, it looks like it. see a small murder of crows gathered on a dirt path that cuts through some dry farmland. They follow this Orlin, who is slowly making his way down the path. They sometimes hop, sometimes fly, gliding after him, but always stay behind. Occasionally one will alight briefly on his shoulder, only to quickly take to wing again and rejoin its kin. As he nears a small village, a crow lands on his shoulder and begins cawing excitedly. The Orland smiles and nods as if agreeing. He takes a small crumb of bread from, his, from a pocket in his cloak and gives it to the crow, who grabs it in its beak and flies a small distance away to eat its prize in peace. Small children, drawn by the noise made by the crow, rush out to see who the approaching stranger can be. When he has a sufficient audience, the Orland lifts both arms out at his sides and, as if they have been trained, the crows flock to him, landing on his hands and arms. They rock, cawing almost in unison, as he stands there quietly humming a lively tune. He looks at the children and begins to tell them uh, strange facts. He tells them of different caws a crow can make and what they mean. He tells them of the pecking order of crow kings and queens long past in the times of their reigns. He does this for some time, all the while his arms bearing the weight of a half dozen crows. 
At a length, his arms seem to tire, and he drops them again, and the crows take flight, spiraling up over his head, and then glide off in all directions, a black, feathery tornado dissipating in the fading daylight. The children's delighted screams echo down the road as they run back toward town. The Orlan stands alone on the road, watching his crows disappear in the, in the distance. Okay. The Fisher Crane. Yes, I'm sure that Anamfa will not commune together for a season at least. The Twice Split Arrows. The Three Tusk Stalegare. The Stone Bramble. Keepers of the Stone. The Guided Compass. Those are the six tribes. Wait. I don't know if I should go through with this. Make the trade deal with the Anamain Fath. Palagina holds out, holds out her arm before you enter the hall. If a Valian deal with the Glanfathens weakens the Deerwood, it could mean war for the Republics in the future. What other option do you have? I could put the idea in the Anamanfath's head that the Republics are not interested in exclusive trade, but limited trade of goods that they do not already trade with the Dear Woodlands. the right thing to do. The Derwoodens are at the mercy of the Republics, and they don't even know it. Your actions today can prevent further suffering. She nods her head resolutely. Another Estramore. What do you want? A middle-aged Orlan woman stands at the back of the longhouse, an expression of irritation on her narrow features. As you approach, she takes a decisive step toward you. I'm looking for another who passed through the city. Few Estramoran are given the freedom of our sacred city. That you ask for this person is suspicious. There are reasons we don't let you Estramoran roam our sacred city. Reasons I am coming to understand. A scowl creases her round face. Has something happened recently? More than I care to think about. Looters have grown bolder at the sights of the builders. The people of Defiance Bay set fire to their own city. And every week, the three Tusk Stelgar bring news of more desperate settlers pushing at our borders, trying to escape their plague of an old fane children. Suddenly you feel the presence of someone else in the hall. The Amon Anam Anamanfath continues to glare at you, but something has stepped out of her skin. It reaches out to you. Permitting more strangers the freedom of the city is out of the question right now. Go and be thankful that Anamfath Shimak doesn't sit in the passage of the Six today. He would not be so kind as I. Feralt. Hmm. A vision of an Orlan man appears near Bethel. He has the same green-brown fur and hazel eyes as she does. Help me reason with them, he points behind you. Turning, you see the ghostly shapes of five other Anamfatha. Another Orlan with tawny fur and scarred face, a frowning dwarf, a black-furred Orlan, and two elves. 
Who's that other Orlem? He looks just like you. A scowl creases a round face. Is this your idea of a joke? Your kind have no sense of subtlety. The spectral Orlem takes another step from her, setting his foot down with a slow, heavy motion. Tendrils of essence strain between them, and he grimaces and leans forward as if struggling against the gale. The angry Anamenfath winces. War! The spectral Orlem's voice is a, is a rasping croak. They're headed for war. Remind them of Furled's warning. Does Furled's warning mean anything to you? Furled's soul image gasps. Taut threads of essence tug at him, drawing him back into the Anamanthath. He looks up at you again. I tried to tell them. The Builder's souls have touched even the Estramorn. You'd better explain yourself. The two attending tribesmen look from the Anamanthath to you, their sword hands ready, her slitted pupils narrow. There are other souls in this place, and in you. You must listen to them. Listen to what? Right now my ears hear only your nonsense. The Builder's souls have touched even the Estramorn. There's no way you could have known this saying. Not unless you are a galoose on Anums. A watcher of souls. She gasps as the last of Furled's soul fades back into her. The tribesmen gape at you. She takes another step towards you. Yes, I am a watcher. She nods. That explains much. Feralt's warning came before the Broken Stone War. Feralt, my ancestor on my mother's side, was Anamfoth of our tribe then. When the Estramoric farmers defiled the Builder's monuments, Feralt urged the other Anamfotha to patience, but louder, angrier voices prevailed. She folds her clawed hands in front of her and gazes down at them. Feralt believed that the invaders could be taught to respect the Builders as we do. He also believed the Builders' souls had spread to all peoples, and that we should avoid needless conflict with others. More practically, he worried that a violent response would only spur further bloodshed across the generations, and you can see where we are today. She spreads her hands. After two wars of the Durwood, his warning is more relevant than ever. While Feralt's words were shrewd, they were ignored back then. Simply remembering his warning now will not undo the wars and the changes that the years have seen. There is blood on these stones, and that is all anyone remembers now. She presses her mouth into a thin line. An image of a polished Adra cube flashes into your mind. There's writing on the sides, but the image is too faint for you to read it. The Anamanfath turns away from you and looks at the ground, gnawing a pointed claw. You can't change the past, but your choices now still matter. She looks at you sadly. Yes, and that is the problem. Another Estramor came through here a few days ago and, well, letting him through was a mistake. One I am eager not to repeat. She levels her gaze at the you. The Guided Compass tribe has a reputation for being too soft with Estramoran. One that will not be improved by my failure to stop this man who has desecrated our most sacred sites.
That sounds like the man I came here to stop. I won't repeat a mistake in my haste to correct it. We bar twin elms from Estramoran to protect the ancient places that the Builders left behind. The Builders left this heritage to us to defend, but they alone had access to it. On this much, at least the six tribes agree. She sighs. You again see the polished Atra cornerstone in your mind. This time the image is clearer. Each face of the, of the stone is inscribed with a phrase you know by heart. You feel your lips form words. A gift from the builders of civilization to the guardians of their legacy. May the guardians watch the door while the builders keep the key. These were the words given to the keepers of the stone. Bethel stares back at you, her tiny, pointed teeth visible through her gaping mouth. What do they mean? She eyes you carefully. They mean that Ferolt's words may indeed be true. Very well. The city is yours to explore. Tell the guard at the gate that you come to see the cornerstone with the blessing of the guided compass. If the gods have truly returned one of the builders to us, find the Delamgon of Ter Evron in Elm's Reach. If the gods have sent you here with a purpose, the Delamgon will know. She runs her hands over her ears, thinking. In the meantime, I shall be here to assist you. One of my companions, a representative of the Valian Republics, wishes to discuss a trade issue with you. The Orland turns her gaze towards Palagina. Yes, the Valian godlike, blessed of Hylia. Palagina bristles and quickly spits out a response. So they say. The Anamanthav's face shows no outward emotion, but her voice betrays annoyance at Palagina's interruption. And diplomat of the Duke's Bells, I understand you are to be sent here to, with trade assurances from your masters. Revered Anamanthav, it is true that I was chosen, chosen to convey these assurances, but understand that I was fashioned more for war than etiquette. The Orland smirks slightly. In these dangerous times, perhaps it is better to send warriors to do, to do diplomats' work. Palagina musters a weak smile. Indeed, Anamanfaf, regarding the exclusive trade agreement, her voice uh, qu quavers slightly and her golden eyes dart in your direction. Yes, I nod. I mean, I told her yet, uh, earlier to do what she thought right, or only do the. Yeah. Palgina steals herself. The Republic's feel it would be in, in the best long term interest if, of all parties if you maintained your traditional good trades with the uh, Durwood. The Anamanfaf's long ears pitch forward. A strange turn. What do the Republics want then? Palgina speaks quickly but confidently. Taondra Tara pearls. Trade will be picking up quickly on them in the Eastern Reach. You will buy them exclusively from us for the next five years. In exchange, we will be your exclusive market for Adraban and Carol Golan for the next for the same period. The Anaman Fav considers Palagina's words for several long moments. An interesting proposal, Valian. We will send emissaries south to discuss the details at greater length. Your appearance here speaks well of your Duke's intentions. Palagina bows deeply. Revered Anaman Fav. That's it. My position in the Brotherhood gone. I can't believe I just made up new trade terms to the Glanfad and Anaman Fav. Postenago. 
Palachina's eyes are wide with panic. Palachina, you did the right thing for the Republics, even if the Dukes can't see it from their vantage. You can deal with their disapproval later. Verus. They have a saying in Biagete. New gold clears even the oldest debts. If I'm right, all will be forgiven. If not, there's nothing I can do about it now. Can I talk to her some more? I'd like to know more about you. I am the Anamantha of the Guided Compass. Like many a Anamantha, I have a leadership in my blood. While tribal authority is not strictly hereditary, we believe that strong leaders can impart a portion of their soul to the children and grandchildren, meaning that An Anamantha may succeed from a single line for many generations. She worries a sharpened thumb claw. Of course, with all that's happened here lately, I've wondered whether my family's line is coming to an end with me. What are the six tribes? Glanthathan society is divided into tribes which are further divided into clans. Each tribe is united by a particular history or way of life, and clans are communities or families that live together. In truth, there are more than six tribes, but the six largest have traditionally led the others. Each of the six have a seat here in the Passage of the Six, where we discuss matters of common interest. You saw, for instance, the debate that occurred before the Broken Stone War. She gives you a hesitant look. The six tribes are the Keepers of the Stone, Fisher Crane, Three Tusk Stalegar, Stone Bramble, Twice Split Arrows, and of course the Guided Companies. Who are the Keepers of the Stone? They are the first and oldest of the tribes. When they first sailed to Air Glantath, they met the builders who gave them the cornerstone, and those words you quoted as a token of friendship. Many of the tribes, even among the six, looked to the keepers for guidance and leadership. Their long history grants them a place of honor in our society, though it has also made them more conservative, in my observation. Tell me about the Fisher Crane. A mostly Orland tribe from the Thane Bog. Most of the sites they guard are half buried in the wetlands, and even the other tribes couldn't tell you where they are. She crosses her arms. They are not the most renowned of the tribes, but they are the cleverest and subtlest. Say what you will about the berser berserkers of the Three Tusk Stalgar. I'd rather face them than a Fisher Crane ambush squad any day. They're named after a long-necked bird that lives in the bog. It can stand motionless for hours, waiting for a muck frog or a spotted salamander. But when it strikes, it's faster than anything. What do you know about the Three Tusk Stalgar? She laughs and shakes her head. Same as everybody. They're fearless maniacs and they want everyone to know it. They're considered a wild bunch, even among the Glanth Athens. Many of their territories have seen the most conflict with the Estramorn, and they and they don't forget it. They don't want anyone else to either. They inflicted and bore some of the heaviest casualties in the wars with the Estramorn. In fact, there was a rift, rift within the Three Tusk Stalgar after the War of Black Trees. Dozens of the of clans broke away from their from the ravaged lands and retreated further into the Durwood, joining whichever tribes would take them. Broken tusks, some called them. The majority of the tribe dug in to the half-buried forest to hold the line, and many respect them for it. She frowns uneasily. They've more than earned their place among the six, but they advocate more conf but they advocate more conflict than is wise, and too many others are quick to idolize them for their valor in battle. Tell me about the Stone Bramble. Mostly dwarves out of the White March. They're one of the younger tribes, formed over the years by trade routes between the wilds and the mountains. They see themselves as genuinely Glanthathen, though, and who can argue with them? Only Fisher Crane defends sites in, in such inhospitable territory. Uh, tell me about the Toy Split Arrows. Oh, let me read this first. Personally, though, I'd say it's gone to their heads. They like to think the rest of us have it easy in the lowlands, forgetting that the wars with the Estramorn never reached their mountains. Still, they came to our aid during both. 
They're named for a tough, thorny little plant that grows up in the mountains. It suits them. Tell me about the toy split arrows. Not many are. They're traditionally outcasts and exiles from other tribes. Probably the least respected tribe of all of them. But our ancestors believe they should have a voice, and so they've got a seat among the six. Most of the other tribes see them as scavengers and bottom feeders, but don't say that to a twice split arrow. They think themselves survivors, and they're as proud of their tribe as anyone else. She, she shrugs. They'll accept anyone, and I suppose there's virtue in that. You never know what you're going to get with them, though. Some clans will rob you blind, and others will slaughter a lamb for the honor of your visit. Uh, the Guided Compass is your tribe, right? Indeed. We're one of the younger tribes and not one of the most prestigious. We've tried to keep the peace with the Estramorn, which has earned us the reputation as appeasers among some of our hard-line brethren in the Three Tusks Stalgar and the Keepers of the Stone. We value our heritage as Glad Athens, but we recognize that the Estramorn are here to stay. The way we see it, we can better follow our mandate to protect the places of the builders by making peace with our neighbors okay that's enough for now your thoughts must flow deeply indeed all right now i can visit other parts of the city Estramore. Sensing you approach, an agitated elven hunter suddenly drops his conversation and turns to face you. What kind of courtesy have you learned in your filthy homeland? A red stripe of paint gleams pearly sweat from a cheekbone to cheekbone. We speak of Glanthathen matters. Be gone. The huntress in the group raises her calloused hand. Still your heart, Redai. Do not forget where you stand. She parts the fine strands of golden hair that float before her face and acknowledges you with a nod. In the house of our ancestors and the six tribes, we commune as one people. Radai looks away and fumes in a restrained breath. The ancestors, the ancestors will forgive me and my brother when I clean the shame away from his name. He looks at the huntress and from the taint has brought to our tribe. But what happened to your brother? My brother... The hunter's heavy breathing pauses for a moment. My brother F Fiorm is the greatest hunter of our tribe. He set out on a blood hunt, but hasn't returned. And now, Arthwin, the puny liar, he claims that my brother, Redai, clenches his fist. The elven huntress fill, fills in the silence. Arthwin belongs to another tribe. He is the hunter that competed against Fiorm during their blood hunt. She gives a glancing look to Redai. Arthurn claims that Fiorm has exiled himself, deciding to not return to Twin Elms. Rudai scowls. His stripe of paint curves like an angry wound. Exiled? In shame. For losing to him during the blood hunt? Can you believe this? Liar! Even though Arthurn returned with the giant Stalgar's fang as proof, it's hard to believe that Fiorm would have failed to kill the prey first. The huntress digs her heel on dark soil. But you cannot claim that yet, Ridai. Not until the Anamphatha Anamphatha judge the truth. Arthun's weak from a lower tribe, Ridai bears his teeth. He lies. I'll find the truth and clean my brother's name. Why would Arthun lie about your brother? Ridai throws his arms in the air. Why? He looks at you as if the answer were obvious. Or die, please. Still your anger. He does not know our customs. The huntress turns to you and nods. Arthurin stands much to gain from claiming a victory over Fiorm. It brings renown and glory to his kin, a lesser tribe, the twice split arrows. Arthurin has no history, no name, and now he returns a hero while my brother, Redai's face, twists an ire. Tricked. Perhaps worse. You mentioned a blood hunt. What is it? We prove our worth in a blood, blood hunt. We set out to stalk it and prey. Always a dangerous creature. And only one kill kills it first. 
The elven huntress interrupts with an exasperated sigh. Yes, but we hunt as pairs, to bond. As Glanthathen, as one, not as enemies. Two hunters, two tribes, one spirit. That is our way. Redai glowers in response. Our way isn't to lie. We don't betray our brothers and sisters for our own gain. The blood hunt between your brother and Arthwin has broken the communion of our tribes, Redai. Do not dig in the, hit this wound until you can claim the truth. She turns again to face you. Perhaps her customs appear strange to you, but despite what you see, we Glanth Athens hold our bond sacred. How do you plan to clear Fiorin's name? A bead of sweat rolls down Redai's forehead and hangs from his red painted cheekbone like a drop of blood. It quivers as the hunter's muscles twitch. I can't tarry here while my brother's fate remains unknown. The Anam Thatha must let me dis let me go. To judge Arthwin and to clear our tribe's name, they cannot listen only to your truth. The huntress lowers her head, glancing at you. Before the Anam Thatha, only an impartial voice can speak for what happened. Her die whips his neck and a drop of sweat lingering on his cheekbone flies in your direction. You mean to involve this one? An Estramor? She points at him, her calloused fingers curved like a claw. Listen to me now. Arthur in return. With proof. Your brother did not even come by. Come back. The huntress blows against the fine hairs floating down over her face. The tribes are split. Something must be done. She looks at you. But this one's words move even stone. I will find I will find what happened to your brother and get to the truth of it. Radai's hard features soften in surprise. You speak with the spirit of a Glanthathan hunter, he nods. The Anum the Anum Fatha would agree to listen. There's no union between you and our tribes. The Huntress nods at you. Fiora and Arthurin went to the Northfield Forest beyond the Old Song Pass to hunt the giant Stalgar. Search there and return to us with the truth if you can. But be aware, Stalgar of such size, many times over their lesser kin, usually gather a big pride that follows them closely. Redai fixes his eyes on you, two glowing embers over the blood-red stripe painted across his face. Estramore, I don't expect help, but I'll do anything to know of my brother's fate and to clean the stain that Arthur has spilled on our tribe. He throws his chin back. Anything. This I claim. Okay. Which I can go to Old Song, Old Song, Elm's Reach. All right, I'll go uh, counterclockwise. Go to Elm's Reach, then Old Song, and then probably to the North Wheel, and eventually to the Burial Isle. Though I imagine that's going to be. I don't know, do I have access? I might be able to go there now. But, uh, Elm's Reach first, anyway. And who knows, maybe they'll be... I like I don't get to spend as much time with her, and she's just so funny. I mean, some of the things she says... ...are not nearly as funny when you've been hearing them for 50 years. Oh, <laughs> oh I love Salter Eagle. I like her, too. Guard places a spear between you and the path that leads beyond the gates. Still, Estramore, 
The rest of the city is forbidden except by the order of one of the Anamphatha. Trespassing in Twin Elms is punishable by death. I come to see the cornerstone with the blessing of the guided compass. The guard scowls and look at his, looks at his companion. He nods back. He turns to you again, his knuckles whitening around the shaft of his spear. Always too cozy with the Estramorn. Go then, and mind your step around the sacred stones. Until my uh, twenty-two hours. All right. All the warriors, blood sands, twin elms, tear Evron, golden grove. I wonder if they'll have some weapons to sell in the hall of warriors. Maybe they have some other stuff. Still looking for a badass Polax. Okay, can I go in this house? The great lioness has grown old and no longer has claim over the sacred lair in Galloway's mom. Size and age cannot best skill and cunning. Hello. Provisions and trade happens in the market. Northwest Harf Song. All right, all right. That's your way of saying uh, you have no business here. That's fine. I'll leave. I don't need, but I'll come back here if I do. All right, let me go to the Hall of Warriors first. Check that place out. Oh, there's Arthur, and that's where I pierced the giant Stalegar with my spear, right through its heart. Oh, Arthur, I wish I could have seen you do it. Me too, and maybe... Later you can show us how you used your big spear. hey -oh! oh, well, yes, I can do that. A lanky hunter grooms his stubble, a patched fuzz of blonde hair, while listening attentively to a young elven woman. She whispers in his reddened ears and giggles. With his head still lowered, he flashes a wide smile in return. The hunter notices you. He clears his throat and straightens his back, adopting an air of dignity. I've been expecting you. My tribesmen have told me that you're to speak the truth about Fiorum's exile. 
He cones a sparse stubble, darting a glance to the elven woman. Well, Arthwin doesn't hide from the truth. Ask and I'll answer. First, uh, tell me about your tribe. We're young, the youngest tribe in Air Glentha. Arthwin hesitates for a moment, scratching his beard, and then spreads his long legs apart. But we're not weak. The other tribes have their history, and now we, the twice split arrows, are making our own. Arthwin puffs his chest and pounds it with a fist. We're true Glanthathans, true hunters. I've proven my worth. His patches are of golden stubble sparkle alongside a glowing smile. It was me, not Fiorm, who killed the giant Stalgar. What happened to Fiorm? Arthwin looks down and licks his lips. Fiorm, he pushes the blonde bristles away from the edges of his mouth. Every tribe knows his prowess, a hunter of great name, but this time he fell behind. We spotted the giant Stalgar on the Sentinel's Ridge above the waterfall of the Northfield. It was stalking for prey. Arthwin like lightly shakes his head. Fiorum wanted us to split. He'd lure the beast to the river and I'd flank it. The hunter scratches a flushed earlobe, but the beast didn't come down to the riverbank. So we tried to circle it on the ridge. I climbed faster and there it was ready to pounce on me. Arthwin thrusts his fist forward. I pierced flesh, mid-air, rolled over and stabbed at it again, and again. And it was dead. The hunter pushes his mustache back and looks up. Fiorm couldn't believe he didn't earn a kill, not even a cut. He said he'd not return with the shame of losing to a twice-split arrow. Arthur signs. I pleaded, but he was a keeper of the stone. He'd not listen, and now he's exiled. Who knows where? Okay. Got your side of the story. Yeah, can I can I go in here? Bethel is too soft. It's good that Simok is here to provide another perspective. Can I talk to Sima? Come to treat with the three tusks Spagar? Tread carefully, Estramore. A grizzled old elf. His hair braided and dyed, stands at one end of the hall. His arms and chest are crosshatched with pale seams of scars. His crooked smile looks like another. It's not many Estramorn who are permitted into our sacred city. Bethel must be feeling especially soft today. Edir pays no attention to the elf and instead has locked eyes with the stale gear in front of him. He whispers to you, Do you think he'd mind if I pet his stale gear? Come to hear your future... At Terra Evron, his smile widens, exposing a row of yellow crooked teeth. Or to make your own at Blood Sands. What's Blood Sands? An ancient place of sacrifice. He laces his fingers together, in a cave by the great elms themselves. Reston and his druids have been an integral part of Glanthathan society for generations, no matter what some of the other tribes might say. Air Glanthath has held its own against the Estramorn because some of us still understand the power of sacrifice. He gives you an appraising eye. Does the thought make you uncomfortable? It should. It is what's kept our society al alive for so long. You don't seem fond of us, Estramorn. His hunched shoulders straighten. I fought in the Broken Stone War and the War of Black Trees. I saw my brethren cut down defending the places of the builders, and I shed blood alongside Galvin Regg himself. He coughs. Now the Estramorns seem to think that they will find a cure for their empty children among our sacred sites, or worse, that they will find sanctuary in our lands. His gaze darkens, and I've seen what happens when they set their sights on Glanthathan soil. 
they're desperate. The best of them want to find a cure. The worst are looking for an excuse to plunder. Isn't there room for you both? He snorts. In 200 years, the Fiends Bay and New Heomar have outgrown their own crooked cobblestones. They rupture and reek like bloated corpses. No, inviting them into our lands will be the end of us. In my 250 years, I've led my people through two wars. Our borders have remained intact and largely through the reputation of the Three Tusk Stalegard. His voice drops to a growl. I've sired a dozen children, but none have been deemed fit to take my place. I care nothing for the legacies that obsess the Estramorn lords, but it is important that my successor continue this path. If your own children don't succeed, what happens? Ordinarily, the Rio would turn to others in my tribe, to clan heads and their families. Ordinarily, he levels his gaze. But we share a tradition of fostering the children of other tribes, and the Anamfaf of Fisher Crane has trusted his youngest to my care. He grimaces. And as none of my own blood are fit to take my place, the Rio will look next to this bog child the kin of another Anamfaf to foster, and my foster daughter to take my place. Bogchild? His shoulders stiffen. I have nothing but respect for Fisher Crane, but their ways are not ours. The Orleans of Fisher Crane have lived in Thane Bog for a thousand years. They are cunning and furtive by nature, which serves them well when they have swamp lands to hide their mo movements. He crosses his arms. But this will not deter the Estramorn on open ground. I wouldn't be so sure. There is greater fear in the unseen enemy. He points at the warriors gathered near the fire. Our savagery has deterred the Estramorn from further encroachment. They still tell of our deeds in the Broken Stone War. But if a child of Fisher Crane leads our tribe, we will lose that boldness, and the Estramorn will lose their fear of us. The child will be influenced by the souls of her ancestors. In times of crisis, she will not look. To, she will look to her kin in Thane Bog for guidance. No matter what I might try to teach her, it will not be enough. He considers you. There is a way you could help if you have the stomach for it. But I think you have the perspective to see why certain unpleasantries may be necessary. He wants me to kill the kid, doesn't he? This Orland girl has a soul of a leader. If it were passed to one of my own offspring, our tribe would remain strong. A stale guard, Simung side scratches its massive head on the Anamthaf's leg. He remains steady on his feet. The druids of Blood Sands have a way to do this, and they understand the importance of a strong line of succession for Three Tusk Stalgar. Aloe's eyes n narrow the slits. This sounds problematic. Ah, uh, yeah, Aloe, we're on the same page here. He gives you a key. There's a house in Southeast Harfsong next to the river. The child will be asleep, and I've arranged for her to be unattended for a time. His voice becomes a quiet rumble. Take her and bring her to keep her Rida in blood sands. She knows what must be done. When she presents you with the liquid essence, bring it back to me. What will keep her Rida do with the child? His scarred face twists again. Have you seen the rituals of blood sands? She will sacrifice her. It is the only way to distill her essence. Alof sighs bulge. Fine! I'd rather distill this old bone bag into a right fine paste. The Orland child, go on. I won't do this. I do not relish the deed, but two centuries of leadership have taught me that all things bear a cost. He nods once. Consider it well, Estramor. I am not above rewarding those who are of service. Well, I'm not going to do it, but tell me about your clan. The boldest and fiercest of the six great tribes of Air Glenthath. 
It was we who first defended against the Estramor who came to shore 200 years ago. He raises his chin. We have always been the border tribe, and it has always fallen to us to hold the line against outsiders and invaders. What do you do here? As Anamfab of Three Tusk Stalgar, I guard our, guide our tribe in all matters. He looks to the main room of the hut, where others have gathered. I am in Twin Elms to, con to confer with some of the other Anamfatha about the Anolfen, your Hollowborn. We only have such births here on occasion, but it has made us more vigilant about our neighbors. One Stalgar stretches, flexing its claws. Simok's eyes is narrow. There are some of us who believe your Anolfen will be a punishment for the defilers of the Builder's sites. Others say it's a plague carried by the Estramorn. Well, they're both wrong. People make it what they want it to be. And when it ends, if it ends, they'll make up reasons for that too. Yeah, I'm not sacrificing that kid, Bubba. Ooh, who's this? Liras. A young man approaches you with a swift and purposeful stride. Why, you've never met him before. He has the same stern, wild look as Simak. He doesn't speak until he's right next to you. When he does, his voice is quiet. Wait, I saw you speaking with my father. What's this about? He glances back at the room with Simak. He's asked you to sacrifice Vela, hasn't he? He grits his teeth. Maybe he's right about three tough Stalgar grown weak. But if this is the price of strength, it isn't worth it. The tribes have survived this long beca because we've stuck together. No, no, Lyris, I have no intention of sacrificing the kid. The grieving mother nods, barely more than a child himself, and yet he speaks wisdom, compassion, a pity his own people did not deem him fit to lead. I would never hurt the child. He sighs. You did not seem like one who would, but my father will find someone who will. He doesn't give up an, on an idea easily, he sighs. But there may be a way to stop him. He frowns. There's an herbalist among the ovates of the Golden Grove. Bleda. That's her name. They all gather southeast of here by the river. She could brew a poison. Simak wouldn't know the difference until it's too late. Wow, I, I don't know if I'm really down for killing Simok either. I don't think I should be getting involved in this. You want me to murder your father? No, but it's better than allowing him to murder this child. Why not just return the child to her birth parents? It's complicated. A child sent to be fostered by another tribe isn't allowed to return. Unfortunately, explaining that we're shielding her from my father would make matters much worse for both tribes. He tugs at a thin braid. Only yes, if Simak dies, you're next in line. It's not like that. The Rio have already determined that my soul isn't strong enough. Whoever follows my father, it won't be me. I gotta think about this, he scowls. I hope you don't have to think too hard about it. With another glance at Simak's chamber, he backs toward the door. I'm warning you now, Estramor. Don't go anywhere near Vela. I'm my father's son in one regard, anyway. Well, you can relax. I'm not gonna kill the kid. I don't know if I'm gonna kill your father either, though. In fact, I'm probably not gonna kill your father. This table is scarred and stained from years of use. Not unless I'm forced to do one or the other. Crates contain a few necessities of Glanthath and traveling parties. Furs and blankets, sturdy hide clothing, and gifts of carved Adra. off here and 
then next time I'll explore the rest of this district and possibly more. I can guarantee there will be no child sacrificing in the next episode. That's not happening. Or any episode follow that. I'm not killing that kid. 